<clears throat> Last week, we looked at the latest issue of Time magazine, whose, whose cover uh, piqued some interest. And we had uh, a, a kind of a lengthy discussion concerning DNA and God. Joan? Uh, and this was the cover that was in, uh, and, and the question that was on the cover, does our DNA compel us to seek a higher power? And it says, believe it or not, some scientists say yes. Now, one point in the, the study that stuck with me was the conclusive proof of the electrical properties of DNA. The fact that change can be made to DNA through electricity. Now this to me was, was vitally important because when one tries to connect DNA with what we call God, I mean, you know, here you have something that's real, no question about it. And here you have something else that, you know, nobody knows for sure. And so we're trying to connect the two. But when we try to connect the two together, we arrive at the fact that the electrical properties of DNA are what would agree with the Bible to make a connection to what we call God. Let me go over it again. If we agree that there are electrical properties to DNA, and we're trying to, according to this uh, magazine, make a connection with God, then the Bible itself provides the facts or, or the answer for us that we can. So let's take a look at this next. And here, we, we, we've gone, used this one over and over again. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man. That means God is not human. God is light. So what that then says, we know that DNA has electric properties. And here, the Bible is telling us God is light or God is electric. Now, of course, when you get into cosmic stuff and ether stuff, you, electricity takes on a different connotation than it does here, where, you know, 120. And we're talking about electromagnetism that fuels and, and propels everything that exists. So the Bible then is expressing itself as, as this type of a document, that what we call God is not a human being, okay? So all the while our teachers and our preachers are talking about this heavenly father and our movies are conjuring up this person with a white beard and, you know, so forth, the very scripture itself is saying, no, that's not what this is. Whatever it is, it's not that. It's light. It's, it's electricity. Now, the other thing that the Bible says that's interesting about us is that we are created in the image and likeness of this. Now, what we've tried to do, or what religion has tried to do, is make what they call God created in the image and likeness of us. But the scripture says, no, we are created in the image and likeness of this, meaning we are light, we are electricity. So the point being then that human beings having sex together create human beings, and you become made in the image and likeness physically of your mother and your father. But as far as that invisible electric part that operates the body, that is light, that's electricity. 
and is created in the image and likeness of what we call God. Now DNA, as, as we learned in, in, in studying this, and you can take that down, DNA has two aspects to it. And the, the second aspect is you know, negotiable, and, and we, could, we could consider it. Did you have a little problem there? OK. Um, according to what we learned last week, we know DNA, the property is physical, and that's us. Now, the second thing is what the Buddhists suggest is a spiritual DNA. Now, that's something that basically goes beyond the stream of proving, although not without some logic, because what they're saying is the first DNA comes from your mother and father. The second DNA is a spiritual DNA that stays with us from body to body. In other words, we change the spiritual DNA, or I guess you could call it karma or whatever word you want to use, but we change it on the basis of our activities on the earth. Once we leave the body, the body dies, the physical DNA stays here and goes back into the earth. The spirit DNA stays with us. Now, as I said, that's open to a lot of conjecture because it's something that's not provable. This is. Physical DNA is provable. Spiritual DNA is not provable. Well, it's a belief, and that's what the um, Buddhists believe. And I, and I guess what, what they're saying there is that, you know, you pick up the chromosomes from your mother and father, and you, you have all the people that you live with, and you develop a personality. But what impacts that personality as well is what they call a spiritual DNA or these uh, um, points that are part of your electro personality that inhabits body after body. So even though we're uniquely different in each body, according to them, there is a basic sameness which we carry with us into each Incarnation. Now, the word incarnation becomes difficult for many people, especially in our culture. Reincarnation. But, you know, it's not reincarnation. I mean, you don't come back as the same person. You don't, you know, come back. I mean, it, it's, it's a continuing cycle of this electro element, which is personality moving from one to another. I mean, it could be a different planet, it could be a different country, it could be a different sex, who knows? But, I mean, it's not reincarnation in the terms we always apply to it, but it's, it's a logical, reasonable thing uh, once we understand the nature of electricity um, and light, photon, and so forth. Once we have looked at the um, scientific experiments, the laboratory experiments with photons, to realize that it is absolutely 1,000% impossible to kill that photon. You can't do it. Uh, they've had major um, tra teleportation experiments, which I didn't bring me copies of tonight, but uh, maybe we continue this, we will. Um, major teleportation experiments in which they take the photon property and destroy it, only to find it showing up three and a half feet away. Now, three and a half feet has always intrigued me, but it shows up three and a half feet away. Did it, they did it in um, Europe somewhere, I forget what country, and they did it in California. Teleportation, that's the beam me up Scotty type of thing of, uh, of Star Trek or Star Wars and all that kind of stuff. So you cannot kill. I mean, science has proved that it is impossible to destroy or kill this photon, this light. It can't be done. And if that's what we are, and that's what we are, because a simple look at a, an EKG or EEG, whatever they call it, that you know, when a person dies, it, it doesn't register on the book screen anymore. 
the electricity is gone. And we've had numerous studies here in which we've shown that scientists have concluded that light or photon is intelligence, and that's where the intelligence is. So that's what the Buddhist philosophy is, that this electricity, which is our personality, survives, which it does, and moves on to another body and operates that body. But though it picks up the new DNA uh, from the physical persons of that particular tribe, it brings with it its encounters in these previous bodily experiences. So, you know, that's why I have such a, a, a strong feeling against executing people. Because, you know, for the sake of this discussion, their spiritual DNA will go into a new body and more than likely do the same thing again. And, and I think our experience, you know, in history and in seeing things as living people is that this, this, this terrible thing that we call evil is repeated over and over and over again. There's a sameness to it. Now, the Time Magazine article that we showed you there was not equating DNA with God, but simply asking the question as to whether there is a gene in each one of us that draws us to God. And that, that fits with the way, you know, in my mind goes, because basically DNA, and, and, you know, and I wouldn't call what the Buddhists are talking about spiritual DNA, although I guess it's acceptable to refer to it that way to, for, for conversation's sake. But I accept this because DNA is a physical element that really has nothing to do with the electrical person that we really are. It's, it's, DNA is strictly physical. Now, we just came off a study, too, <coughs> over the past couple of weeks of the ancient Coptic Gnostics from ancient Egypt and the book, it's a strange mystical book which um, has given us a lot of stuff to, to chew on, the book of I E. O U. What was interesting about that is that this legend from the most ancient times of Egypt identified the name of God, which is something, you know, we, we don't even have a name in, in Christian circles for God. But they identify God's name as I E O U. And what's interesting about that is the fact that I, E, O, U are international symbols that stand for the same thing throughout the world. And here in the overhead that we've shown before, we'll show it to you again. I is electricity, the symbol for current. E, electron. O, ohm, resistance. U, uranium, Uranus, the symbol for internal energy. So we have electricity, current, which flows through the body, electron, which, you know, part of the atom, which makes up our bodies, ohm, which is electrical resistance, and that is part of the elements of energy flowing up the spine, which must be resisted by the seven seals to arrive at the brain at the right um, current, and you, the symbol for internal energy. So that would be the name of God. That's the name of us. Current, electron, electrical resistance, internal energy, and that is given as the name of God. So not only does the Bible in the Old Testament say God is light or electricity, but this most ancient document names God as I E O U, which are the international symbols for what we just covered. God is light, invisible subatomic electrical power. And since we are made in the image and likeness of God, that's what we are, not your physical body. But because of our attachment, and you can take that, and we have an attachment. We were just talking about this a moment ago. We have a really a terrible attachment to superstitious religious doctrines and principles. And I would repeat that, superstitious religious doctrines and principles. And since we have such an attachment to them, and they have such a hold on us and our families, we're never able to think in terms of what 
and who we truly are. We're not allowed. We can't even discuss it because we run the risk of, of alienating our friends, alienating our family, uh, you know, being drummed out of the church and all this stuff. We, you know, we're not, we're not allowed to question it. We, we just have, if we raise this stuff, we're oh, no, you can't think that way. And it causes all kinds of bizarre behavior. What I'm saying to you is that the superstitious religious traditions, doctrines that we are raised with, causes all kinds of bizarre behavior, which become traditions. And these traditions result in bitterness, a deep aching longing and sadness within every person. I, I received um, an email from someone who was deeply saddened by the fact that her mother, who was uh, suffering from cancer, was being sent home by hospice. And um, because, you know, she wanted to be home uh, when this day came where she might die. Well, she wound up being home one day, and she died. Now, the person writing the email, who was her daughter, her daughter asked for prayers. Her mother was brought home. Within a day, she died. Or at least that is what I was told. Now, I add that because we have never, ever, because of religion, we have never, ever been able to assess what death is or what happens to our loved ones. We're not allowed. I said before that because of our connection to religion, we were involved in bizarre traditional behaviors. So we're forced to end a particular relationship. It may be with a mother, a father, a brother, a sister. But we must end that relationship with a nonsensical encouragement that, well, he or she is in a better place. You know why they say that? Because there's nothing else to say. Nobody knows what to say. So they say, oh, she's in a better place. Or... Don't worry, God needed a cook up in heaven, so it's bizarre stuff. But that, that's, that's the limit of what we, we're allowed to think. We, we don't question what happened. Where did that person go? This person I love so deeply, where are they? Because God needed a cook? You know, and I'm, when I'm telling you, I personally experienced it. My father was an interior decorator for Macy's and Bamberger's. And when he died, when I was in the, you know, very young at the time in the funeral parlor, people would come in and say, well, God needed an interior decorator up there. You know, I said, boy, I don't want to be one of those. And, you know, I don't want any part of this. But that's crazy. And it's, it is bizarre. But that's as far as we can go. There is no common sense ever found between religion and reality. There is no common sense between religion and life or religion and death. There's no common sense. I, I myself, uh, you know, just had an experience with Joan. We both went through it. I lost my sister of many, many years. And it prompted a deep sadness you know, emotions run high in every family when this occurs. You know, the feelings become very, very difficult. My sister was 79 when she died, I died of lung cancer. And I knew her by the person inside, but it became more and more difficult for me to realize her as this person I knew because of her physical appearance. I mean, this girl is a tower of strength to me. 
uh, in the early years. And, and quite frankly, and without getting into all kinds of stuff, if it wasn't for her in her young years, I wouldn't be here now. That's, that's how significant she was. Um, so after she died, you know, I went through pictures and I saw her as a young person. And I, I, I immediately was able to relate to her, her life and her energy, her person, what she really was, before the physical started to take its toll. And I, and I, don't, I don't just mean getting old, and I don't, I don't just mean, you know, cancer. I mean, the things that we're exposed to, the food that we're exposed to, the the air that, you know, all of the different things that impact on us and do things to us and cause things to happen inside of us, the things that we're encouraged to uh, take part in by the advertisers and all that stuff, they take a terrible toll. A and so what I found, what I hadn't seen her really in such a long time um, to where I knew her as I really did. When, when she was there for me. And it brought me to a point of coming to grips that she always was this person portrayed by a body and not any different really because of this age or cancer. But obviously her, her light, her spirit had been really wrecked by what went on on the outside. So when I think of her, I think of her personality, who and what she was. And I see it in a picture of youth before it took the toll. And I see it in this picture of her from, from long ago. I'll show you a picture of her. This is, this is her. And I'm kind of proud to be able to share it with you. And, and you know, of course, uh, what happened, you know, those scratches are from the old picture, but um, what happened over this course of time, you start to see where, you know, all of us, it shouldn't, it shouldn't, get, it shouldn't become, it shouldn't get that way. Things shouldn't, that, that beauty and, and that spirit and that light, it shouldn't be destroyed by all the different things that we do, we do wrong. And then the deterioration of a, physical body takes that totally away. And, and it left a, someone like her to, to begin to struggle inside of a physical deterioration in the same way that we struggle with a deteriorating car. We can take that. And once we get rid of the car, we, we forget about it. Oh, you know, you have a car, and then on an occasion you'll, you'll mention what a good car it was. But once someone gets rid of the, their deteriorating body, the rest of us make visits to the place where it was buried. And we place flowers on it. And we file into funeral homes, and we make acquaintances with people that we haven't seen with a long, for a long time. It almost becomes party time. While, while the deceased lies in a box that costs about five or ten thousand dollars. A box that's going to be buried in the ground. And we're encouraged that this box is waterproof. We never even asked for what? Why? But do you know why we go through all of that? Because our religion teaches us that one day all of the bodies in these cemeteries are going to rise up again. One day all of these bodies are going to come out of their graves. And you know the worst part of it all? We buy it. Hook, line, and sinker. Some of us even construct concrete buildings to hold the remains. Because the attention is on the dead body instead of the living person who has moved to a new life. My sister, whose picture you saw there, is my sister. The person, the body finally gave way, and she's, she's gone to another one, and her youth and her vi vigor and light is restored. <coughs> and the person who has moved on 
is totally frustrated. Because instead of being at peace and meditating into a contact with that person, we run around trying to protect the dead physical remains that were a mess anyhow. Our concentration is on the dead physical remains. If you, in, in these religious cults that are active in this country, and around, if you go up to the pastor or the priest and start talking about making contact with your departed loved one, you'll be told it's of the devil, don't do this, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is demons at work and all of this stuff. Just go to the cemetery and put an American flag in it and all that stuff. But you know what? It's the same people that don't pay any attention to what the biblical Jesus said. In the Bible, there was a guy that came up to Jesus, and he said, you know, I really want to follow with your group. I think you got, you're right on. But he said, you know, my father just died, and I've got to bury him. And you know what Jesus said? Look what Jesus said to him here. Matthew 8, 21. Another of his disciples said, allow me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Oh, what? That doesn't sound... Ver because what he was talking about was dead bodies are dead bodies, and if people that are dead to the reality of life, let them bury it. Let them put people in cemeteries. Let them put people in, in caskets and line up people to come around and, and, and then go to somebody's house to have ZD after all this stuff. Let them do that. He said, but you... If you're alive, and if you want to, want to think of life, follow me. Because the Jesus of the Bible had no time for dead bodies. He had time for living souls. And I hope you catch the point here. Let the people who are absorbed with the physical bury dead bodies. Follow the one who is concerned with the living. The living within, the living without. In other words, why are you concerned about a body with nothing in it? Be concerned about the person who is in that body, but no longer is. Throw the body away. Throw the car away. And you're not going to throw the driver away with the car. Well, you're not going to throw the person away with the dead body. The Jesus of the Bible knew of the endless nature of life and the complexities involved in moving from body to body. It becomes very complex. Let me take that. You're in this body, and then this body wears out, just like your car. And you say, I got to get a new car. And you're in this thing. Like what happened to my sister, what's happened to your family, Morris? I gotta get a new body, I gotta get out. It's just terrible. Can't live like this with this kind of body. And so you're into another one. And there you get into the new chromosomes of the family, and you bring along through your electro person, your personality into this. It becomes very complex. And it was an interesting thing happened in the Bible. Uh, they, uh, Jesus and the guys came along this guy who was blind. He had been born blind. And his disciples said, who sinned that this man, was it this man or his parents that he was born blind? Isn't that interesting? His religion and Christianity, they don't believe in reincarnation or, you know, any of this stuff. You know, they say, oh, you die, you shoot up into the heaven. That's not what it says here. Who sinned? Why was this guy born blind? Did he commit a sin? You see? In, in, in other words, in a previous existence. Or was it his parents? Were, you know, were, they, were they messed up the genes or something? And Jesus said, no, it's not that. It, not him, it's not his parents. It's the works should, of God should be made manifest in him. So in other words, he leaves up in the air with a statement that whether you want to call it synchronous, there is a purpose somewhere of this guy being in this defective body. But there's no doubt 
that the discussion centers around the person's activities and those of his parents before he occupied his present body. In other words, what's being discussed here is what happened before he occupied his present body because he was born blind. So the, the person who no longer can occupy a damaged physical body moves immediately, and get this one, into the realm of the subatomic, which is teeming with life. If you, if you were to go down into the bottom of the ocean where nobody's ever been before, it's teeming with life. We don't know, because you don't know it. Does that mean it doesn't exist? The subatomic, here you take that. The subatomic simply is an invisible realm that exists on a frequency different than ours. You watch Channel 2, and you might have politicians. Up on Channel 7 is a football game. And if you're watching the politicians, you can't see the football game unless you're able to get to that frequency. And when you get to that frequency, there's the football game and the politicians are gone. It's all, it's all this kind of stuff. Now, if these people, and this is, this is where, if these people that we suppose to be dead, such as my sister and other than yours, are indeed living, can they respond can they communicate with us? Can they materialize? And to all three questions is on the basis of um, things that have happened in the past? Yes. Now, my hesitancy to believe such stuff, and I, I would never even discuss such stuff in the past. But much of my hesitancy to believe this stuff has been eliminated by my understanding of the subatomic realm, where life exists beyond our ability to perceive it. So since it's definitely there, what's, you know, what's the reason to be apprehensive? I mean, most people, they go to church and they'll tell you about the spirit and all this stuff, but they have no, no concept of what quantum physics is. The study of the subatomic, the invisible, the, the power, the intelligence that's there. They don't even know it's there. But if the person that we think is dead is definitely there, then what is the reason for us to be obsessed with the dead body that we're throwing away? And I don't care if you call it a cemetery or if you're calling, you put stones on it with pictures of angels. You're throwing it away. You can't keep it around because you'd get sick. So you throw it away. Now, over and over again, I have showed you scientific experiments by prestigious scientists showing that thought never have a thought, love, fear. It's not in the physical body, but it's in the non-physical electoral person. In other words, everything you are is not in your body, but in the electoral person, which you are, that operates the body. The computer's up here, but somebody has to operate the computer. Somebody has to program it. You're doing it here. I'm doing it here with this. If I raise my hand, it's because the person who I am has decided to do that. It can't go up unless I decide, because it's just stuff. There was a very famous scientist by the name of William Crookes, C-R-O-O-K-E-S. And he lived from 1832 to 1919. He was an eminent scientist. He has re received all kinds of awards in the fields of science. I'll show you his picture. I'll show you his picture of the guy here. That's him. <coughs> William 
crook. You ought to write that name down. And if you're interested in this stuff, you ought to uh, go on the internet and uh, mess around with this. This guy was one of the most respected scientists of his time. And he took it upon himself to study something that was very taboo in England. It's taboo right now in the United States. The paranormal. He looked at reports from mediums and people who communicate with the dead and seances and all that stuff. And he said, I want to I want to check this out from a scientific standpoint. Now, most people expected that Mr. Well, it well, wasn't Mr. Crook. You know, this guy was knighted by the King of England as a, as a Sir William Crooks. So, but most people expected that he would return and support the religious position of the Church of England and that all of this was the devil and against God and quackery. And that's what he had initially said when he started the investigation. Uh, William Crooks said, well, you know, when you mess around with... Uh, discussing our spiritualism, there's a, a lot of room open for trickery and stuff like that. But you know the strange thing happened? What he did was to prove the existence of life beyond what we know as death. And when he published his results, he was set upon by the scientific community as well as religion and they ripped this guy to pieces. And the only reason that I'm even discussing this, because I wouldn't insult your intelligence by doing this, the only reason that I am discussing this is because Sir William Crooks has credible background which is beyond, you know, question. He wasn't just a scientist, he was the imminent, profound scientist of the time. And so, when you have somebody like that, if I'm going to say to you, well, you know, somebody in a, in a, in a rock shop told me this, uh, you know, I'm not going to come. No, this guy is at the top of the, the heap. And so you have to look at somebody like this with, uh, you know, in the, in the realm life of Carl Jung and people like that and say, we better listen to him. I can't prove anything. I'm not saying he's right, but I'll tell you one thing. He knows and he knew a whole lot more than people who wore robes in churches. He wasn't a superstitious person. But this is what he said in the next overhead. He said, I am attacked by two very opposite sects, the scientists and the know-nothings. Both laugh at me calling me the frog's dancing master. Yet I know I have discovered one of the greatest forces in nature. And do you know what that force in nature that he was talking about he discovered? Life, living people who we think have died. That was the scientist, William Crooks. The scientists were calling him nuts and the know-nothings of the religious people. And he says, in spite of everybody screaming at me, I know I have discovered one of the greatest forces in nature. You didn't take that down. Now, in order to consider William Crooks, and this is where I come from, and you know that, and if you've ever come here before or whatever, I never do anything or say anything unless I will give you the credentials that you can decide whether the person is credible and reliable or you decide he's a kook. You've got to, dis you, you've got to always look at a person's credibility. As soon as somebody tells me something and I say, well, what are his credentials? And I say, well, he's a graduate of this theology school. I'm, I'm gone. I don't want to hear that. Here's a guy who is finding something in seances with mediums, etc., and the religious world and the rest of the scientific community is attacking him. 
And, and you know, I, I, don't, I can understand why. So let's look at this guy's credentials before we decide, and you'll decide whether you think that we should listen to him. We'll look at him. William Crooks was born on the 17th of June, 1832, in London. He studied at the Royal College of Chemistry and became one of the most important scientists of the 19th century, both in the field of physics and in chemistry. He combined private experimental research with business. He also edited several photographic and scientific journals. Having inherited a large fortune from his father, he devoted himself from 1856 entirely to scientific work of various kinds at his private laboratory in London. You can do the next one. In 1861, he discovered the metallic chemical element thallium. He discovered the metallic chemical element thallium. So he must be pretty smart. <laughs> this led him indirectly to the invention of the ra radiometer or ra radiometer in 1875. He later developed a vacuum tube, the precursor of the X-ray tube. His studies of cathode rays were fundamental in the development of atomic physics. He was knighted in 1897 and received the Order of Merit in 1910. He was a fellow of the Royal Society, becoming its president between 1913 and 1915. Now, would you say he seems like a credible person. Do you, do you think that his background scientifically, especially given it back in the 19th, that he's credible? I would think so. I would think that on the basis of his uh, accomplishments in science, he is someone who should be taken seriously. But in the case here, he, he is, he's going against religious beliefs, and that is not politically correct. And thus, he has these people coming against him as they would today. Okay? In other words, he was a wonder. I mean, look, the precursor to the development of atomic physics and, and the X-ray tube, and he'd made all of this stuff, and he was brilliant, 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 brilliant. But suddenly he starts talking about the reality of those we think of as being dead, of being alive and materializing, and he is instantly considered a nut because the religious people have been offended. The, the traditions have been, you know, torn down by this guy. Okay, let's take a look at what he did. William Crooks, as a scientist of international repute decided to investigate spiritualism. He was initially very skeptical about it. He explained the reason for his inquiry. I consider it the duty of scientific men who have learned exact modes of working to examine phenomena which attract the attention of the public in order to confirm their genuineness or to explain, if possible, the delusions of the dishonest and to expose the tricks of deceivers. So all he's saying here is, look, I'm not, I'm not taking a position. I, I just think, I mean, so many people are attracted to this stuff that I want to look from a scientific standpoint and see if there's anything to this. And if, and if there's not, if it's a bunch of trickery and quackery, you know, I can't tell. So as you can see, he goes into the work with an open mind. And as a scientist, he's either can confirm that communicating with those who we perceive as dead is genuine, or he's going to expose the others as delusional or dishonest. Okay, let's take a look. He began by studying one of the most famous mediums of all time, Daniel Douglas Holm, and was soon convinced that Holm was endowed with a powerful psychic force. Many believe that Crookes would expose the phenomena he witnessed, but this rapid conversion to the ranks of believers surprised the public and shocked his scientific colleagues. Yet he undertook all his experiments under strict scientific conditions. In other words, 
This is something we don't want to believe. Don't tell us this, because what are we going to do with all of our churches and uh, all of our religious doctrines? I mean, this is the basis of our... You can't say this. You're, you're too prestigious to, to say such things like this. One of the most prestigious scientists of his time has been convinced that communicating with those thought to be dead is real and that they are absolutely alive. Do you want me to tell you what this guy did? A person who materialized from the dead, he took that person's pulse. You want to say the guy's a nut? But you know what? You know doggone well he's not. What do you do with that? If you said, somebody comes to me and says, you know, Bill Don here down here in Fork and River, he took the pulse of a dead person. Like, yeah, I you say, yeah, I know, I heard about him. You can't say that about this guy. You can't say that about this guy. Next. The experiments that made him really famous were with the medium Florence Cook, at the time only a teenager. Through her mediumship, there occurred a series of materializations of the spirit of Katie King, which lasted three years, just before the spirit stopped appearing. Krupps obtained a total of 44 photographs, among which were, according to him, some inferior, some indifferent, and some excellent. And I'm going to show you some tonight, a couple, of him standing with this person. It's amazing. You know why I say it's amazing? Because it's actually Looney Tunes, except for this guy's credibility. I can't get around that. Let's go next. When, uh, when Crook started to report about his experiments to the scientific community, he found unrestrained hostility. He was even accused of complicity with Florence Cook and of having an affair with her. Yet he never changed his mind about the reality of spirit phenomena. In his presidential address to the British Association in 1898, he said the following. Thirty years have passed since I published an account of experiments tending to show that outside our scientific knowledge there exists a force exercised by intelligence differing from the ordinary intelligence common to mortals. I have nothing to retract. I adhere to my already published statements. Indeed, I might add much thereto. Sir William Crookes died in London on the 4th of April, 1919. I have nothing to retract, he said. And it certainly would have been easier for him to do so. Here's a man whose credentials as a renowned scientist are beyond question. Yet because he dared to go where others fear to go, he was attacked. Religion has such a tight control over the minds of people. And it was even worse then that someone as brilliant as William Crookes cannot be listened to when he says he has proof that people who we think have died are actually very much alive. You would think that would produce great joy to come from a scientist. But instead of listening to a person of such stature as William Crookes, you can take that, the people instead chose to listen to the robed ones and their aligned power politicians. And so you see what we've lost. People, you know, we've lost the very ones we love so much not because they are gone beyond our ability to communicate with them, but we have lost because we have chosen to live our lives in the fears religion has placed on our heads. And we're going to get back to William Crook's contacts as well as some others, but first let me, let's look again at the event of death and where and how a person would leave. How, how would it happen? Do, do we have any proof of that? I want to go to a subject we covered before, but one that becomes very important when we discuss this matter of how someone leaves a broken body at what we call the time of death. This is a Time magazine article, and it's, it says the O spot for out of body. An out of body experience, scientists believe 
they know why. This is something called the right angular gyrus of the brain. And it says here, ticket to ride. A shock here can launch the mind on a short, strange trip. Shamans teach that out-of-body experiences are best achieved through meditation, reflection, and transcendental calm. Scientists believe they have found a less celestial source, the right angular gyrus of the brain. The new thinking is the result of the case of a woman, 43, who was undergoing treatment for epilepsy originating in her brain's right hemisphere. A team of researchers at the University of Hospitals of Geneva and Lucerne, that's in Switzerland, wrote in Nature last week that to pinpoint the problem, it implanted electrodes in the suspect region to record seizures and used a weak current to map the brain. The doctors and the patient then got a surprise. Let me go to the next one. When the current was applied to a particular spot, the woman experienced a sense of lightness as if she were floating above herself. More remarkably, she seemed to see part of her body as if she were viewing it from the ceiling. When the doctors asked her to move her, her limbs, she experienced other illusions. One arm seemed shorter. Her legs seemed to fly towards her face if she closed her eyes. Her upper body flew toward her legs and all this kind of stuff. The point here is that something occurred. Now, later on, it goes on in the, in the discussion that what they found is each time that they put their probe at the right angular gyrus, this happened, that, that, she, that she had this situation occur where she would be up on the ceiling again. And when they took it off, she's down in her body, and they put it on, and she was up on the ceiling again. And there was some kind of misfiring. Her sensations were caused by a failure of the brain to integrate tactile sensations. Transient out-of-body experience can occur in anyone, but one glance around and usually come back to the, to the brain again. But the point being that there is a way that almost like a little electric door opens, and when this thing is stimulated, the person inside the body is out, and this person found herself on the ceiling. So we have a situation, you can take that, where the phenomena of a person actually getting out of the body is proved. I never, I never put a whole lot of faith in that because nobody could prove it. It's proved. When the right angular gyrus of the brain was stimulated, something happened to transport this, par uh, transport this person out of her body and up to the ceiling. Would it then be out of the question to consider that when the body no longer can support the person, that the right angular gyrus activates and that person leaves in the same way? Now the problem all is this, is that in the New Age as well in religion, there's bizarre responses to everything. People, a lot of people who claim to be spiritual and, and are in the New Age movement are really involved in the same emphasis on the body as our religious people. That's what's so... The right angular gyrus that happened in Switzerland that was stumbled on by these doctors trying to help this woman does not mean that you should stick something in your head so you can have an out-of-body experience. We shouldn't. All it means is that science has found a door created by nature to provide an escape from a broken body at the proper time. But do you know something? People around the country who have seen that report from Switzerland about the right angular gyrus have already gone into business. And look at what's being sold. There it is. They're putting things to stimulate the electricity into the brain of the right angular jar. People are actually selling electrical stimulants to cause an out-of-body experience by stimulating the right angular gyrus of the brain, not knowing what in God's name could happen. I mean, it's not, these aren't doctors or scientists. These are crazy people trying to get a 
physical jolt. An out-of-body experience is nature God created for a specific reason. An out-of-body experience is to free the person from the body for a particular reason. It's in the hands of nature of God. You can take that off. Now, getting back to William Crookes for just a minute and proving that death does not exist and that the person we thought was dead is very much alive in the subatomic or realm, there are two quotes I want you to consider. One is from Albert Einstein, which I believe would apply to William Crookes. And the other is for William Crookes himself. William Crookes was asked by a bunch of screaming scientists if he thought it was possible for a dead person to communicate with the living. Now, these two interesting statements. Einstein said, great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. <laughs> and William Crookes said, I did not say it was possible. I said it happened. Isn't that great? What an answer. You mean it's possible for dead people to come back? I didn't say it was possible. I said it happened. I love that. What a great answer. He, what are you saying? I can't explain this. I'm just saying it really did happen. Now, I'm going to give you a website that you may wish to visit. It is an attorney by the name of Victor Zamet, Z-A-M-M-I-T, who he kind of devoted his life to defending William Crook's reputation. Uh, you can find it at www.victor, V-I-C-T-O-R, Zamet, Z-A-M-M-I-T.com. Okay? www.victorzamet.com. And Victor Zamet's an attorney. And, and he went and studied everything about William Crookes to defend him from all the onslaught of people. And he raises some points to counter those who accuse William Crookes. You can take that. As being anything in the fraud. Victor Samet said of William Crookes, undoubtedly, Sir William Crookes, the discoverer of thallium and one of the world's greatest scientists, is one of the most controversial and maligned figures in psychic history. Scientists from all over the world have showered him with honors for his brilliant scientific investigations. Critics have tried insidiously to destroy his credibility. Anti-psychic, anti-afterlife, conservative, negatively prejudiced scientists unconscionably and most unfairly tried to dismiss his great psychic achievements. Yet, over the last 125 years, his experiments have been successfully repeated and his impact 